this is Bear Creek Lake Park. We have about 2,600 acres that we manage for recreation. Uh, most of the property here, here is owned by the Army Corps of Engineers and leased to the City of Lakewood for recreation under a 50-year lease. And then we do have some city property within the park as well. We serve a huge variety of recreational uses out here, ranging from the fishing on Bear Creek Reservoir behind us uh, to hiking and mountain biking and horseback riding on multi-use trails, limited motorized boating, uh, public swim beach, environmental education programs, campground, just a huge variety of recreational resources here. And we see about 400,000 visitors a year at this point, and that's been increasing every year for the last five years. On September the 9th, we ended up having a very unusual event occurred in this particular watershed where we ended up with a lot of large rains. Yes, I know up north we ended up with the big rains, so we ended up with Big Thompson, Boulder Creek, same for rain, they all flooded. And part of the question has been, what did it do to the Bear Creek and Bear Creek watershed? One of the things that we can see when you look around this particular area is that the reservoir did fill back up. A lot of water came down this particular area. So how big of an event do we have? And it's, it's a little more difficult to put a handle on when you're looking at the size of an event. It's usually measured as a five-year event or a 10-year. You can even have a 25 and occasionally you can have a 500-year event. What we saw when we're looking up north was extraordinary. The press called it biblical when we were looking at it. So up north we ended up with a thousand year event in a couple of the locations. Some of the first reports we had, we were, talk, we were hearing anywhere from a 250 to a 500 year event. But really the size of that event is based off of the flow that's coming back into a reservoir like this. What we saw in the town of Morris and at the peak flow that the urban drainage and flood control recorded about 3,200 cubic feet per second. We know there were some additional flows came in from Mount Vernon. So the reservoir at its peak probably reached around 3,600 cubic feet per second. Put that in perspective, that's the largest flow that's occurred in Bear Creek in about the last 50 years. So from that perspective, it was a big event. But does that put us back up into those large scale ones? No, it puts us back into something on the order of really a 25 to a 50 year event in this area. So not as large as what we saw up north, but it was a little bit different. Those are usually based off of single events. What we saw here is we saw multiple days of large events. So we saw a lot of flow came in. So as a result, the amount of water that came down Bear Creek and Turkey Creek reaching this reservoir in the month of September was close to 34,000 acre feet of water. And what you ended up with at peak loading in this reservoir was about 15,000 acre feet. So when you look back up around here, you'll see these new high water marks and that's approximately 55 feet above the current level that you're looking at. And that's where the debris lines are. So you took this reservoir from a normal pool of just over 40, 45 feet and you took it up at one point when Mike and I went out and took a look out here, we had 95 feet of water under us when we took some samples in the reservoir. So that was unprecedented in terms of the amount of fill. In fact, that's the first time that we've had this particular reservoir fill up to this level. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were out here on an almost hourly basis in the beginning, measuring the pressure on this dam to see how the dam behaved. Took a look at how this reservoir filled back up, and of course all of us have photographed it to see how this reservoir has changed. And like any kind of a flood event like this, it's going to fill itself up, at, and then it's going to be the water level is going to drop back down. So remarkably the water that was released out of here was a high volume at 1.650 cubic feet per second was released out of the inlet so they could drop the water, drop the pressure back off the dam. And actually the key here was to end up making it prepared for the next large event because that's what this whole reservoir was built for. It's a flood control device. It was built to protect downstream interest. And in this particular case, it worked extremely well. So one of the things we know is that this reservoir really saved probably billions of dollars worth of downstream de um, damage by being able to hold back those floodwaters and not have the South Platte River itself flood as it went through Denver. So it worked really well. But from what we do as a, a watershed association, this is gonna have some consequences. And you can already take a look around. There'll be some consequences from the use of this particular park and the recreational. We'll have some others talk about that a little bit. But from the water quality standpoint, we're now going to have to figure out how to adapt. 
So what you have is a reservoir out here, and in this water you're looking at, it has multiple uses. This can be used for the recreational uses, like the fishing activities. You've got people that go out, and uh, you can do uh, some minor boating out here. You've got other activities and recreational uses in this area. This is also a water supply, so it has to be protected for water supply. It's also designated for agricultural uses. And then the big piece here is it's, it is designed for aquatic life. And in Colorado, we have lots of different aquatic life standards. We have cold water, we have warm water, and even under cold water, you can have cold one, cold two. This is a cold water reservoir, although it actually functions as a multi-stage reservoir, so we have both cold water and warm water fisheries in here. So part of what we have to look at is what happens to those those chemistry in here to those standards in here as it affects that classification. And when you fill up a reservoir this much and you add the amount of material that came in, it is going to have some large consequences. So what do we know happened out here from a water quality standpoint? We took some measurements here. We know that that was approximately 2 million pounds of what we call suspended materials. Now what suspended materials is, it's this really fine material. It's this this fine kind of clay-like material that you'll see here in this area. So the very, very small particles. Well, what's that equate to what came down out of the, out of the river? Was that 100,000 tons? Probably not. It was probably more on the order of about a million tons of sediment washed down Bear Creek. Not all of it made it into the reservoir, but a great deal did. So what we have is where the where Bear Creek comes in, Turkey Creek on the other side, we end up with a great deal of sediment load that occurred back out here. But with that sediment also came other things. You can see the debris and you'll see the debris lines here. So lots and lots of organic material, lots of big trees out here, whole trees in fact were floating around in the reservoir. But we also had nutrients. We had nitrogen and phosphorus that came down. So we measured the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and what we found out here is that during the peak loading, when the, res the reservoir was at about 15,000 acre feet, we ended up with one of the highest total phosphorus measurements that we've seen in the reservoir in 27 years of record. What that equates to is about 15,000 pounds of total phosphorus made its way into this reservoir during that one month period. That's more total phosphorus than we've seen loaded in this whole entire watershed in the last decade. Much of that nutrients will end up incorporating itself down into the bottom sediments and over time it gets re-released back up. So what does that mean to us? It means that in the years to come where we've had some bad algal blooms out here, we've had some of the blue-greens and we were looking for ways to manage and control that blue-green growth out here, we're going to have so much additional nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus out here, that we could end up with larger problems with that algal blooms over a period of time. So we're going to have to look and for monitor that. So that nutrient loading is a big deal. So we're going to have to look as a watershed association for ways to do adaptive management. How do we come back in? What are the kinds of options that we have to look at out here? How do we manage this park? How do we manage the water quality so that we can minimize these future impacts? So when you look at a large flood event that occurred, whether it's a 25 or a 50 year event that occurred in an area, sure, we're going to go back through, we're going to have lots of cleanup into here, and we're going to have restoration, and, and in a year or so it's going to look like, wow, we fixed this all back up. But the truth is, is that we're going to have to change how we look at the standards and the classifications, and it will ch cause us to make new adaptations into how we mess manage this reservoir. As Russ said also, the reservoir came up about 55 feet, uh, which was a tremendous amount of water and put a significant number of our recreational resources and our natural resources underwater, while the creek itself was overflowing its banks and causing damage also to our recreational and natural resources areas. So we've been faced with the, the task now of trying to assess the damage and start restoring the park to a point where it's um, back to usable by the public, safe for the public, and where we're able to kind of assess the damage and the impacts to our natural resources and our habitat areas as well. Um, so at this point we've assessed about $200,000 worth of damage and cleanup to the park. Uh, we've started a lot of that with both staff and volunteers. We've got about 200 hours of staff time put into cleanup so far and over 500 hours of volunteer.
and, and the impacts have been tremendous and varied. So behind me there was a, a fishing pier in this area and a couple boat docks. All of those were impacted, so we have impacts to resources like that. We have tremendous amounts of debris around the park, and that includes mud debris in the parking lots, uh, tremendous washouts on our trails, a lot of litter debris that washed from downstream, so we have propane tanks and shoes and clothes and everything you can imagine spread throughout the park. Uh, impacts, potential impacts to the trees and vegetation, impacts to picnic shelters, restrooms, um, and all sorts of things that were under that water. So we've been working on that assessment and beginning to do that cleanup and looking at ways that we can um, make some changes to the facilities to make them more flood proof, but also restore it back to the point where our public their expectations are met again and we start getting that, that visitation back in the enjoyment of the park. Um, and some of it's going to take some time. Some of our trails have seen significant damage where we will not be able to get them open until sometime in 2014. And some of our other facilities are, are that same way. Uh, and so we're seeking funding for this. Obviously the $200,000 isn't something that we have in our budget. Um, so we're seeking money through federal sources, through FEMA, and also through a Jefferson County Open Space Grant and potentially some insurance money as well, plus donations from the community, which we've been very surprised at. Uh, several special events out here have raised money for us, and then people have also donated money through events, through some of our environmental programs. So that's been a big help to get started on this, particularly since we're kind of the end of our budget year right now. Uh, so it's been a really interesting process so far, and there's a lot we're gonna have to do to begin restoring this back to, back to the way it was before. Particularly for me and most of the park staff here, we've never seen anything like this. I know in 95 there was a pretty significant flood event, but it didn't come anywhere near this level. Uh, so you get to the point where you stop thinking about this reservoir as a flood control reservoir, and we think of it as a recreation area. And then suddenly when something like this happens, it changes your perspective entirely, and you realize, wow, it really is helping people downstream. It's doing its job and we just have to learn to deal with the consequences. And so you look back to some of what was designed uh, and you think, well, why did we put wooden buildings in a, in a floodplain? And people weren't really thinking that way when we put these facilities in place. Uh, so some of that we're gonna have to relook at. Some of it obviously we're gonna have limitations on. We can't redo everything with the funding, um, but we'll at least take some of it into perspective. Some of our trails we're gonna have to look at. They don't have a lot of options in some of their areas, but can we look at ways to armor them a little bit more to make them a little bit more prepared for this sort of thing? And then when we look at new facilities down the road, maybe we can make things in areas where they're not gonna be impacted or that are gonna be able to withstand this just a little bit better so we don't have the same sort of, uh, I guess, damage down the road. We're standing on top of Bear Creek Reservoir. This was authorized in 1968. It's a rolled earth structure. It's designed to hold back the floodwaters that come up out of this area, which would be Bear Creek, and then the other canyon over here where the deep V is, is Turkey Creek. So both of these come back in, water then flows back through down to the South Platte River. This is approximately a mile, struct, mile long structure. The reservoir you're looking at behind you is designed to have a pool of about 40 to 45 feet. And then what you look at is it, it will design to fill itself up and flow back over here. It actually has a capacity for 78,000 acre feet of water and it would have up to about 500 acre surface acres before it spilled out and flowed back down. What you're looking at out here in the reservoir, when you look back out in this area, you'll see there's a series of aeration devices. We have an aerator that's pumping air onto into the bottom, and what we're actually doing is breaking up the stratification in the reservoir to increase levels of oxygen to protect the fishery. This is a really good mixed fix fishery out here. On this end, you'll see an outlet structure here. The water goes out through there. It's actually a glory hole. It goes through this dam structure coming out to the outlet here. On this side, what you'll have is smallmouth bass. You also have sogai that are found on this end. When you get back up to the far end to Turkey Creek and the Bear Creek, you end up with trout, so a mixed fishery in this particular area. In fact, right now after the big flood, it's even a better fishery. After the flood, I ran into a fisherman down below here who had caught a 23-inch rainbow, which we know came from upstream where they feed and fatten up the big trout. So the big fish are back into the reservoir. We do have a person that fishes out here. He actually thinks there may be the next record um, smallmouth bass. We'll have to see what this all looks like now after the flooding. And you can kind of see where the debris lines are and the water came back up here. You can see the big fill up onto here with that water. So recognize that was roughly 
about five trillion gallons of additional water that came into the reservoir. That's enough for the city of Lakewood, all the residents in the city of Lakewood for well over a year. So there was a lot of water that came into this reservoir, got filled up, got released. This water's now, the, that water's already made it down to, um, through the South Platte system, down into the Missouri system, and is on its way to the Gulf of Mexico. It wasn't all bad. This whole incident that occurred has helped us upstream in the watershed. In fact, this watershed that you're looking at is about 236 square miles of watershed. One of the things we had happening was much of the stream along Bear Creek was getting impacted by fine sediments. That was hurting the bug population that, that helps feed the fishery upstream. So it's what we call embeddedness. As a result of this big flood event, all of that real fine sediment that was incorporated in the bottom of the, of the stream is now washed itself out. So what that's going to do is actually improve the upstream fishery. It did make a lot of changes to the stream. We've got a lot of deep holes. Was it interesting? There's a spot here within the park that is a plunge pool. Before the flood, it was maybe two and a half or three feet. We now estimate it maybe about 12 feet. So great storage for fish. So there are some positives that came out. There was a concern during this whole process that we might have had a lot of wastewater. In fact, there are 16 wastewater treatment facilities located upstream. We had no breaches at any of the wastewater treatment facilities. And even in the park where we have bathrooms and these things were pumped prior to the, uh, the flooding, so the amount of wastewater that made it into the reservoir was minimized. So there was very good planning. There was good strategy on how to prevent the waste from getting into the reservoir. So while there may have been concerns about fecal coliforms or other things getting into here, those were actually minimized in the process. So we've learned some good lessons too about how to better manage upstream. Many of the upstream um, water and sanitation districts are looking at better ways to armor even their pipelines and their and and uh, other structures up there to make it easier to protect in the future. So it's really been some good things that have come out of this as well.